Hello, my name is Sue Mary and I'm an Alexander teacher. This is a short presentation as part of the Alexander in Education Conference 2020. It's mainly for Alexander Technique teachers and trainees, although other people might also find it of interest, particularly perhaps classroom teachers and parents. A little bit about me, um, I began this work with primary school children in 1994 when I began working at a local state primary school. That led on to me being asked to be a founder member of Educare Small School here in Kingston in 1997 and the school is still open, still running and I'm still working there and my aim is to try to find ways to integrate Alexander work into the school day. Um, once we had quite a bit of experience, Judith Kleinman and myself decided that instead of working together in a sort of slightly haphazard way, doing presentations here and there, that we would actually become more focused and create curricula for primary, secondary and tertiary education. So we began the developing self and we started to teach the Alexandrian Education Training course. This presentation today forms a part of the primary curriculum. It's the first step in that curriculum, which is to introduce Alexander work to the classroom teachers before you then go into the school and start to work with the children. So let's take a look at one way in which you might do that. It's a way that I've found to be very effective. So I guess I see there as being um, three steps forward when it comes to introducing this work to classroom teachers. The first step is to simplify and clarify the work. The next step is to look at the features and benefits of the work and then to introduce the ready list and transitions. Now just remember here that you've probably, you know, I would find in doing this that I would probably have not a lot of time to work with these teachers. So it's quite important to keep it simple. So let's look at simplify and clarify. So I'm asking myself, how much time do I have? How many people am I going to be working with? How interested are they? They, they might be there under duress and also to deconstruct any technical terms. So that's the work I do before the workshop. It's really looking at what are these words? What do they mean? Inhibition and direction. Um, and I want to be able to use simple and clear language when I'm teaching this to these teachers and also language that will be uh, that I'll be using with the children as well. So this work all fits together. So what they're learning is the language that I will also be using uh, with, the, with the children. And now looking at features and benefits. So there's going to be two main questions in the minds of these teachers when they come to my workshop. And those two questions are, what is this? And what's in it for me? What's it all about? What, do I'm gonna, what am I going to get from this to benefit my life? I think, first of all, in the explanation of what's, what, what this is, I'm much more likely to engage their interest if I can keep it simple and not too long. So simplifying, clarifying, this is where we come back to this. Um, so giving a simple explanation and maybe a handout that can be, uh, can be referred to after the workshop. Something again, really simple, but with an indication of where you might find more, uh, more deeper, and maybe complex information. So you can always recommend a few books or websites. And if you want to see an example of the handout I use, which is very, very, very short, uh, you can download it from the Developing Self website. Um, it's on the resources page, I do believe. So explaining simply, and then really the main focus, I think, should be on uh, what's in it for me. How can this benefit me? Because 
if people can find that there is some benefit in it for themselves, then they tend to be much more open to the fact that it's a good thing. Uh, and maybe it's a good thing for the school too. So if it's good for me, it may be good for the kids. One hopes, of course, to be able to do some hands-on work, um, which can be tricky depending on the size of the group and whether or not I've got some help. But also, I think the most uh, important way people can find that this is of benefit to me is if they can find a way that they can use it in some way quite soon, like uh, uh, right now, immediately. I can use this information in a practical way and then I get a different experience is what I'm probably trying to say. So let's look at the way I find it, or a way I find to be extremely effective and that's by the use of the ready list and then moving on to the use of transitions. The ready list is stop, see, breathe, soft and tall. Now this is the version that we use at Educare Small School. Um, everyone takes it and slightly adapts it for themselves. I believe the genesis is with uh, Walter Carrington. I picked it up from Judith and began using it with horse riders before it occurred to me that actually it would be really handy to use it with the children as well. Stop, see, breathe, soft and tall. So the reason it's useful, say, for example, with horse riders, is because uh, it's very handy in situations where there's either a lot of pupils and or you can't, for some reason, do a great deal of hands-on work. It actually encourages the pupil to really think. I found that it really gets their mind engaged um, and their mind engaged with a, how they're thinking, and B, what their body's doing as they're thinking. Another really useful thing about the ready list is that people can use it straight away. So when it's put together with transitions, they can leave the workshop with tools that they can apply immediately to, um, to their lives, not just their lives in the school. So I try to give people an understanding of what the list means and why we're asking them to stop see, breathe, and what soft and tall is. So let's take a look at some of the ways I might start to explain the different features of the ready list. Some simple ways I might explain stop would be to say that the stop part of the ready list is absolutely essential because unless you stop, you won't be able to do the rest of the list. Why is that? Well, first of all, it gives you a space to think about doing the rest of the list, but also it's, uh, it, creates, um, it creates a space. Everything really does stop when you think stop. And it's not for a huge long time, but it, it sort of puts the brain briefly into neutral. Uh, maybe only for a sort of half a nanosecond, but it just gives you an, um, an opportunity to make a different choice about what you do next. So I don't generally get too much into the idea of habit at this point. Um, I keep it quite simple. And then I might explain that when you think stop, it's a bit like putting the brakes on in a car or pressing a reset button in your brain. It just gives you a, a sort of level playing field to work from to apply the next parts of the ready list. Um, and it's also really helpful. So if your mind is racing uh, and you feel a little bit out of control emotionally, thinking stop just really does make things stop even for a short while and allows you then to have the potential to take control of the situation. So now let's move on to how I might explain C. So the first part of explaining about C 
is to explain exactly what I'm asking the person to do when I ask them to think C. Because it's not just a thought, it's an action. So what I'm asking them to do is to raise their eyes, uh, look into the distance, ideally. Oftentimes we're looking at very close quarters like this and looking out, expanding your focus, your range of vision. So looking away, changing the focus of the eyes and actually seeing something rather than just looking at it. So you are registering what you are seeing. So I'm, maybe I'm going to look across the room, I can see a particular picture with a map on it. So it's actually making that dialogue in your head, you know, what am I actually looking at? I'm looking at this, so that you are registering what you're seeing. Uh, you're taking an interest, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say, uh, in what you're seeing, so that you are seeing it because looking is not always seeing. And I might go on to explain a little bit more about you starting then to touch on the uh, neurological aspect of why to do this. When we are fearful, uh, we tend to stare. So moving the eyes around breaks up that pattern. It also activates different areas of the brain. If you are, for example, uh, focusing on something too intently, what we might call concentrating, uh, you probably staring. So, you know, it's interesting to ask people to notice this about themselves. When you're really trying to process something, you often stare and stop breathing. And most people are familiar with this and will laugh when you point it out to them. So staring shuts down the brain, usually just at a time when you want the brain to be working well for you. And let's move on now to looking at breathe. So now that we've uh, got people exploring their use of their eyes a little bit by seeing rather than looking, we come on to asking them to breathe. And uh, I usually get everyone to have a go at breathing by uh, breathing out first and then waiting for the breath to come in by itself. And then when that happens, just allowing the body to expand with the breath. And as they're doing that, of course, you're looking at what's happening. And I might be, I might be asking them to notice if they can breathe without involving the shoulders or without making <gasps> gasping noises. So we can talk about all of that until one has an understanding, uh, at least as much as I can manage in, in such a short sort of space of time, uh, of what, what breathing might mean. Something different perhaps than most people think. So I guess everyone teaches that in their own way, but it's just to get everyone to breathe in a free and open Alexandery type way. So once I've got that going, then we look at why. Why is breathing important? What's it got to do? Uh, why is it a part of the ready list? So what I might look at then is um, asking people, again, going back to the whole concentrating thing and asking people if they've noticed, do you hold your breath when you're concentrating? And most people, you know, recognize that they do. And then just talking about how crazy that is because we need to breathe in order to oxygenate and oxygen is really necessary for the brain to work well. And if we want the brain to work well, we don't want to be shutting it down by holding our breath. So people find that quite understandable. Um, also, sometimes I mentioned that breathing can balance the nervous system. So uh, maybe not going into it in huge detail, but it does balance the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. If you take three um, full breaths, easy, relaxed, deep breaths. So I often like to link the breathing up with the idea of stress and uh, managing stress because this is a big topic in schools right now, mental health in general and also high anxiety conditions, OCD, self-harming, all these things that are happening. But certainly for teachers, they have, uh, they have more to do than they can do. And that, of course, is very stressful and overwhelming. So looking at breathing's part in balancing the nervous system can be, I think, helpful 
um, at, in relation to those problems. And I might also mention that once the nervous system is, is in balance, even if it's only going to be temporary, uh, it, it does enable the rational part of the brain to, to work more freely. Because when we're in a stress situation, uh, the, the neocortex tends to not be involved or to shut down while the body's emergency systems take over and deal with the perceived threat. I may or may not go into that. It would depend really on how much time there is and, and how interested the, the group would be in, in going in a bit deeper. But basically, most people can understand if you hold your breath, your brain does not work as well as it might. Plus, you do tend to feel a little bit stressed when you're holding your breath. So now let's move on to the, the what's I think the slightly more tricky part, which is soft and tall. Soft and tall. Hmm. How do we explain this? Because this is really the part where you really need a little bit of hands-on work. So if possible, that's what I would do at this point. Um, I would go around and give them a little bit of hands-on work. Hopefully I'd have a few helpers to assist me with this. But even that isn't uh, very much really. You've got to try and find something that they can take away with them and apply straight away. So they may get a glimpse of what's possible from some hands-on work and hopefully think, yeah, I'd like a bit more of that. But you can also give them some things to think that do help a lot of people, not everyone, but can help a lot of people with the, the idea of, of uh, directing, um, of having um, a better use than they've got at the moment. So again, keep it simple. And I also use the words I'm going to be using with the children. So we talk about sometimes, you know, the head floats up, the shoulders melt down, which is a very kind of shorthand and simple way of making a start. And I'm really emphasizing this of understanding what direction is in your body. Um, it's not a replacement for traditional Alexander teaching. It's not a replacement for hands-on work. So please don't all start emailing me and complaining. It is just a way in. And after that, you hope uh, that perhaps the teachers will like to have a bit more hands-on work and discover the wonderful richness and depth of Alexander's work. I would also be, of course, explaining, um, I mean, apart from the fact that you would hope that they would feel that soft and tall is of benefit, there's also useful to give some explanation of the whys and wherefores, really. Why, why do we need to have uh, better use? What, what is that all about? What's the point of it? And of course, you can then start to connect it up uh, with what they're seeing happening to children in the classroom. I, I just like to make the points that the, the loss of poise that, you know, most of them will see this. They'll see children slumping over the tables, lying over the tables, uh, leaning, leaning on their work, you know, this whole thing when you're writing. Uh, most of them will see that, recognize that, those patterns. And to, to make the point that it's actually not inevitable that that happens. And it's also not inevitable that the, the, the overall, in fact, good use and beautiful use and balance that these children have. It's not inevitable that one loses that and uh, enters into a world of pain uh, with back pain, neck pain and goodness knows what else. Um, that's not necessarily that doesn't have to happen. Then I might also talk a little bit about the fear reflexes um, and Alexander's discoveries of uh, the importance of the primary control without using the words primary control at this point. Um, and I think perhaps explaining that when the body's soft and tall, it's, it's more invited to exit from a stressed fear response. So perhaps bringing this back to uh, changing how you behave can change the way that you feel. A lot of people are feeling very stressed, coming back to that again, and changing the way you behave can make a difference to that. And you can always change the way you behave. And the ready list really helps you to do that. So these are some points I might make, but I think 
what will come out of the group will also determine the way in which this explanation is given. Um, it's like any group, really, isn't it? What they bring with them, if you can take that and use it and help them to understand what you're saying through that filter to a certain extent, that things that relate to their own lives. So um, that would be some ways that I would uh, explain soft and tall. And also, of course, pointing out that this is the language I will be using with the children. A ready list is a way of, like, you might be able to just about start a book or something. And you don't want to suddenly go, OK, I've got my pencil going, I'm going to start writing. Um, and you've got to calm yourself down first and think about what you're going to do, rather than just rushing on. And so you good way of doing it would be to do your writing list and it goes like this you have to stop and you have to see and you have to breathe and you have to do your soft and tall body which is when you let your head float up like your head is a balloon and your shoulders melt down like they're on custard so let's move on now to looking at how to apply the ready list in your life right now. And to do that, we're going to look at transitions. The idea of transitions comes from my work with horse riders. So for riders, particularly say dressage riders, Transitions are all important. It's moving from one state to another state. Um, and this is what happens all the time in, with riders, where they're going, say, put it really simply, from halt to walk, from walk to trot, from trot to canter, from canter to trot, from trot, you get the idea. So each time they come to make one of these transitions, they're having to think about a lot of stuff. Um, they're giving the horse the right signals um, and, you know, where they are in the arena. There's a lot of considerations. But what we're looking at, of course, when I'm working with a rider is what they're doing with themselves as they come to make the transition. Now, the idea of transitions, it doesn't obviously have to be about riding. I say obviously with, with a slight smile because it probably took me quite a considerable number of years before that obvious thing dawned on me that actually anybody could benefit from the concept that you can apply the ready list every time you come to a transition. So let's look at how we might identify transitions. For classroom teachers, I would ask them, can you tell me at some point, perhaps in your working day, where you move from one thing to another thing? So for an example, you might be sitting on the floor reading a story to the children and then you get up from the floor to move on to the next activity. Or perhaps you're moving over to a child and then sitting down beside them at their work. Or maybe you're transitioning from being in the playground, say, to coming back into the school building. It doesn't matter what the transition is. So we would talk about that. And so we can identify some possible transitions. And I think it's very important to emphasize that they choose something fairly easy, because if they begin with something that totally stresses them out, you know, like the kids will burst into the room at once, or I have to do this, I have to do that. It, it's going to be really difficult for them to remember initially to um, apply the ready list. So, so I, I really encourage that people come up with something very, very simple. And we can role play that if we have time. So we can actually maybe work with one or two teachers in front of the group, or I might, uh, if I've got some helpers, ask them to help me and we break up into smaller groups and look and discuss about these transition points and then trying to go through them, but uh, doing them with the ready list. So you do the ready list, then you do the transition. You know what I'm talking about here. It's basically inhibit and direct. So um, 
I think if we can get them to understand that and then say that you can use this little system of ready list before a transition. So the transition comes up, you employ the ready list and then you act. You can, you can do this system not just at, at uh, school, but also in your life at home or any situation you like. And in fact, you know, it might be easier to start by practicing it at home. Although I do tend to find that I think it's really interesting how the mind compartmentalizes things. And sometimes, you know, people think if something relates to school, it's only at school. If it relates to home, it's only at home. And it can be quite hard to get them to see, actually, no, it's, it's like for everything, for your whole life. So as we were looking at the school, it, it might be interesting to start off at first by encouraging them to really focus on a transition in the school. Uh, and really, you know, saying this is, you can do this and you can take control. To change the way that you feel, you have to change the way that you behave. And that this is a real easy step into that process of changing the way that you behave. And now a quick review of the information in this talk. We started with three simple steps. Simplify and clarify, features and benefits, the ready list and transitions. And the ready list being stop, see, breathe, soft and tall. Now a handout with more details is available from the developingself.net forward slash conference. You will have already noticed that the children use movements when they practice the ready list. We do this because movement anchors learning. And since we introduced movements into the ready list, even the youngest children can remember it. And I just want to give a thanks at this point to Alessandro Fattorini, who inspired me to put movements into the ready list. I'll talk more about the relationship between movement and learning in another video. So I think that's that's probably about as deep as we can go into this topic in, in just a short presentation. Um, thanks for for bearing with me as I struggle to uh, come to terms <laughs> with the technology involved in doing one of these things. Uh, we're all on quite a steep learning curve at the moment, I think. Um, I'm hopefully going to produce um, a video on the ready list for the general public or you know, Alexander pupils or whatever. So look out for that. Uh, and maybe subscribe to our channel on YouTube um, so you get the latest things coming through or, or, you know, also I shall be sending out notification to the, to the email list. Um, and also I expect anything will be on the website. So look out for more stuff. And uh, just leaves me time to say uh, thank you again. Uh, take care stay well, and most importantly, have fun. <laughs> this work, this work is fun. Thank you. Goodbye. Even though he was dreaming, he remembered his ready list. Stop. See. Breathe. Soft and tall. Mr. Jackson let his shoulders melt down and his head float up. Then he felt calm and centered, and he did start to wake up.